like to share the screen. OK, so um, welcome everyone to today's SOAS Center of Taiwan Studies uh, seminar. Uh, today we are uh, the seminar will be the book launch of women migrants in South China and Taiwan. And today's talk is the first of four talks that we're running uh, this week. We've uh, we've got this online talk. Tomorrow we have two in-person talks and we have another one um, uh, on Friday. In fact, uh, we've got two speakers from uh, uh, from Canada this week because uh, we have a speaker from the University of Toronto on uh, on Friday. But I'll give you the details of those talks um, at the end of today's uh, session. So today we're delighted to welcome Dr. Beatrice uh, Zani, uh, who's giving her first ever uh, SOAS talk. We always kind of in these kind of situations, we want to apologize for taking so long to bring uh, Beatrice to uh, SOAS. Um, Beatrice is um, currently a postdoc at McGill University in uh, in Montreal at the Department of East Asian uh, Studies. Um, and before that, she did her PhD in uh, in Lyon, uh, and she also um, had a research associate position at uh, University of Tübingen's uh, European Research Centre on Contemporary Taiwan. So, in fact. Um, uh, I think it was about last April or May, our roles were reversed and, and Beatrice was hosting my uh, book talk at, at Tubigan. So it's really nice to kind of change uh, things uh, around. Um, before uh, we started, my colleague um, said about how nice it was to actually um, invite Beatrice. And it's also really nice in terms of the timing of this week's um, uh, talk, because in my Northeast Asia politics class, we're actually looking at um, migration in East Asia uh, next week. So it's a great way for us to kind of get into the mood of next week's uh, discussions. Um, Beatrice, uh, even though she's still quite a junior scholar as a postdoc, but she has a really uh, impressive um, uh, CV um, with this um, uh, new book, The Jewel in the in the Crown of this, uh, of this CV. Uh, she's also been um, very active in the field of international uh, Taiwan studies. Uh, for example, she's a, a EATS um, a board member, as well as her uh, previous role at uh, Tubingen's Taiwan uh, Center. And the other thing that I have to mention is um, that we do have uh, Beatrice's book at the um, uh, SOAS library. We've got the ebook. Uh, so, um, um, if you enjoy today's talk and there's things that you that you want to learn more, please go ahead. Uh, for those of you that are SOAS students, and um, uh, take out the ebook. And if you're not SOAS students, just make sure that your own university library has a copy as well. Uh, Beatrice is going to talk for about um, 40, 45 minutes, and then uh, we'll have lots of uh, time for. Uh, discussion and my colleague will make an announcement. Uh, make an announcement once the chat is open. To you can either type questions uh, or if you um, uh, in the Q and A, if you raise your hand using the hand raise uh, function, uh, you should be able to directly ask your questions. Okay, so um, so welcome Beatrice to SOAS, and uh, we look forward to hearing more about your research. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, David, for well inviting me, for arranging this book launch, for this lovely presentation. And yes, it's fun to see that we we inverted our roles. And last year you were connected with Tübingen, and this year I'm connected with SOA. So thank you very much. I feel very grateful. I'm very happy to be uh, with you all uh, to give you a little, you know, overview and presentation on on my book. I hope you will enjoy this. So, women migrants in southern China and in Taiwan, mobilities, digital economies, and and uh, emotions. To start with, actually, this book is is taken from my PhD uh, dissertation. It was kind of you know an ordeal to turn my dissertation into into a book. I also asked. I remember that. All that I bothered many people, so I'm really grateful that I got some kind advice and support in this 
yes, in this process, which is far from being easy, but it's also very, it's also very challenging. So to get you into my into my book, actually, this book is the story of the journey of an orange fluorescent bra that you can see here. And actually, it's very interesting because this is a made in China bra, a bra which is made in a uh, Chinese, uh, southern Chinese textile factory by the little hands of the factory of the world, female migrant workers in China who move from the countryside to the city to sell their labor inside the urban apparatus. But later, this bra will change a little bit its biography and its social life because from China, from southern China, it will take new roads and it will travel together with its producers, those migrant women, to Taiwan. Um, it, it will arrive in Taiwan and, you know, from a plastic and silicon made uh, artifact, it will become a real commodity, an emotional commodity, showing the uh, processes of empowerment and of agency that those women can put into practice to cope with the situations of vulnerability and discrimination that they do face during migration, both in internal China from the countryside to the city and from China to Taiwan during this remigratory process. And eventually, at the very end, this bra will move back to China together with some women who, after uh, migrating to Taiwan through marriage, settling down, living there for a few years, will divorce and remigrate back to China and they will bring the bra back with with them. So I think you got it. We are talking about an orange fluorescent bra, but we are talking about migration. We are talking about migrant women and their complex and I would say bifurcated migratory paths, which are constructed along three steps, right? So from the countryside to the city in China, from China to Taiwan, and eventually from Taiwan back to China. The origin of, of the story of this bra and uh, the interest actually in these migratory processes comes from my long-term curiosity and perhaps intellectual interest for migration, specifically in China and later from China to Taiwan. When I was a bachelor student at the Institute of Political Studies of Lyon, I got the chance actually to spend an entire year abroad at the University of Nanjing. 2013 and I was actually uh, sharing a little apartment close to university with two Chinese flatmates who were not students at all. They were migrant women who moved from the rural province of Anhui to Nanjing and they were working as nurses in the hospital. However, they came from the countryside and especially with one of them, we really became very close. We developed strong ties of friendship, right? And she brought me back to her countryside, she to her village of origin. She introduced me to her grandparents, to her family members. She also brought me to the city of Ningbo in Zhejiang province, where her brother and her sister had settled and were working in the local factory. So I started to get very interested in those, uh, you know, rural to urban labor migration stories in China of the so-called Nongmingong, the migrant the migrant workers. That was in 2013. And then totally by chance, in 2015, I got a grant by the Ministry of Science and Technology of Taiwan, and I traveled to Taipei. I arrived in Taipei, you know, at that time I, I didn't know much about China and Taiwan. I arrived to Taiwan and I was like, well, what am I going to do here for a couple of months? Uh, it was a research and technique and uh, a professional training program in Taiwan for foreigners. So my my master, actually supervisor by that time, told me, well, you are working on migrant women in China. You could look for some migrant working women in Taiwan. So I arrived in Taipei and very naively, you know, I started work, walking around and asking people. First of all, my landlord uh, in, in Taipei, I was living in, in so we work and I find some Chinese factory girls here. 
and people were looking at me like, are you mad? What's wrong with you? You did not quite understand how things go up. And I was like, OK, well, what's the point? What's the problem? Why there are no Chinese factory girls? Because actually what I, I assumed actually was absolutely wrong. Women cannot smoothly migrate from China to Taiwan as they would do from the countryside to the city. They have to go through a little very important process, a contract, which is marriage, which is the only legal condition for those Chinese migrant women to settle, to enter the Taiwanese territory and to settle down there. So I did not quite think about this marital tie necessary for migration. And then from that point on, I just got a very different uh, view on this on this mobility process from China to Taiwan and and I could you know build up new research hypothesis on which I I, I, I later developed my my PhD my PhD research so from that moment on I started looking for marriage migrants who were coming from Taiwan and not from for factory girls anymore and uh, July 2015, very hot July, I was sweating, I remember it was like 40 degrees in Taipei, I think you know the feeling, 200% uh, humidity, I was walking around, I don't know why I ended up there, I was in Nansi Jiao, in the suburbs of Taipei, I was walking around, looking for a place to cool off, nothing, desert, and then I saw a sort of lingerie shop, which was um, very colorful. There were a lot of bras and underwear showed in the shop's window. So I decided to enter, thinking that there would be DAC there, and I, I was looking for a place to cool off. And then I entered this shop, which was absolutely messy. All the bras and the underwear were on the floor. The, it was absolutely empty of clients, and I was inside alone trying to you know, cool off, and I heard someone speaking with a very strong Sichuanese accent, and this person was Fudin, the owner of the shop, a Chinese migrant woman who came from Sichuan and was living and working in Taipei, and who indeed got married with a Taiwanese national to settle down there. And I saw Fujin approaching, and you know, she was not talking to me, she was talking to her phone, she was sending some vocal messages to her phone, so I interrupted her, I said hello, we started, you know, she greeted me, we started talking, and she shared with me her story, so it, actually she came from China, she came from the countryside, she had been working in, in Shenzhen and in, in Guangzhou, in Canton, in southern China, in Guangdong province, she, she worked as a factory girl, and it was there that she met the Taiwanese man who would become her husband and later um, remigrate to Taiwan. And in Taiwan, after a few years where she was at home taking care of her children, taking care of her parents-in-law, taking care of her husband and uh, of the you know housework, um, she decided to become an entrepreneur and to invest some money to open a lingerie shop and to import some bras and underwear uh, from China, so this is the this is the beginning of this is the beginning of the story. The the orange bra owned by Fujin and sold sold by by Fujin. So I don't want to tell you too much about this book, because I still hope that you will you will read it at some point. Um, if I had to briefly describe the structure of my book, I should say that well, it is organized around. Um, around the story, the life, the biography, the social life of this orange fluorescent bra and this uh, social life, object social life, is a good chance for me to discuss about, well, the biographical, the migratory, the professional, the familiar experiences of uh, the women who produced and later re-commercialized this bra during their migratory uh, processes. What you will discover in this book uh, is that behind the bra are hidden broader processes of migration and mobility, but also the emotional fabrics of migration, mobility and entrepreneurship and the way migration, emotion and uh, women's experiences are constructed uh, through and across the digital platforms. 
this book tracks and follows the bra to narrate actually those uh, Chinese women three-step mobility, rural to urban labor migration in China, marriage remigration to Taiwan, and then eventual post divorce remigration to China. And that uh, it shows how labor, marriage, and migration cannot be really separated into you know um, different phenomena, but those are highly interconnected and imbricated through women's ambitions and aspirations and processes of biographical, migratory, professional and familiar transformation. This book uh, follows women's free migratory paths and it is therefore organized around three parts. Part one on the move, which deals with road to urban labor migration. Part two connectedness, which deals with women marriage migration from China to Taiwan and part three in betweenness, which looks at women's third, the women's third step of, of, of mobility. So from Taiwan back to China. And it is um, uh, organized around, I wrote eight, I have no idea why, but nine chapters. So three chapters per part which follow, as I said, women's migratory biographies and the commercial geographies of the objects that they do produce and later and later commercialize. Um, methodologically speaking, I follow the bra, I follow the women, I developed a kind of itinerant ethnography, what I call an itinerant ethnography, which includes indeed 17 months of multi-sided ethnographic work both in China and in Taiwan that I carried out when I was a young and inexperienced PhD student between 2016 and 2018. So I was in Taiwan and I re-traveled back to China. I did not immediately move to the cities, the, um, the factories where the bra was manufactured was, were implanted, but I actually traveled beforehand to the rural areas of Anhui, of Sichuan and of Guangdong provinces Chinese migrant women come from. And later I moved to the big coastal cities of Zhongshan, of Dongguan, of Shenzhen and partially also of Canton, where these women migrate to from the countryside and uh, where they spend a few years actually before marrying and remigrating to Taiwan by working in the factories and living in the in the local dorms. And later I refollowed women from China to Taiwan. So I spent almost eight months in Taiwan between Taipei, Hukou, Xinzhou, Zhudong and Zubei. I was by that time uh, junior visiting uh, fellow at the Academia Sinica, the Institute of Sociology, and that was also very helpful because I was based in Taipei and I could, you know, smoothly travel around to spend time with, uh, with, with my informants, actually. I was carrying out observation, participant observations of women's daily life and familial life. I was babysitting their children, I was cooking with them, I was spending time, time both individually and collectively with them and their social networks of, of friends and of Chinese fellow migrants. But I was also helping them during their entrepreneurial activities, whether in the physical reality on, or online. To open and to negotiate my field sites, I've actually been teaching English at the second floor of this lingerie shop in Nansa Ziao. With Fujin, we made an agreement since I was looking for Chinese marriage migrants, said I can give you something, I can teach you some English every Tuesday afternoon, actually evening. And so we arranged the second floor of the shop, which I will show you some pictures later, which will which became kind of a little English teaching room and we were spending time together. And then in 2017, I moved back to, to France, but I kept in touch with my informants. And in 2018, I had the chance to refollow some women back to China after they, their new migratory experience, uh, post-divorce remigration back to China. So from Europe, I re-traveled to Guangdong province where about 30 of my informants had been remigrated to and settled down in. And I was living with Meili and uh, Tialin in their 
part in uh, in uh, in Shenzhen actually, and I could you know uh, carry out some more interviews and some more observation with some divorced women uh, living in China. And afterwards, always in 2018, I refollowed uh, Mei Li to Taiwan during her journey to visit her child and to visit her friends in Taipei. And so I was also following women during their back and forth movements between China and Taiwan, which are part of the actually the making of cosmopolitan transnational lives and experiences of in-betweenness between the two between the two countries, between the two territories at, at least. Beyond this itinerant ethnography, um, which also included, I think I did not mention this, a part of a virtual ethnographic work I carried out inside the WeChat groups, uh, the, the groups of this WeChat application, which is a Chinese online application, very similar to our WhatsApp or to the Taiwanese uh, line, right? Um, I was part of women's um, chat groups. I think I also do have some pictures to show to you. And I was um, observing actually the way they were performing actually online commerce and e-entrepreneurship within the, the virtual the virtual world. So itinerant was not only multi-sided amongst multiple places and temporalities, but also itinerant switching between online and offline sites for interaction, sociality, practice, and indeed economic economic and commercial activities. A last point I would uh, develop, would like to develop here in terms of methodological choices and approach was the way I used um, affections and emotions not only as a tool for my analysis of, of well, the social phenomena I was observing and trying to understand, but also as part of my methodological method. I was a Western kind of white privileged woman, a student by that time, on East Asian field sites. And I came, kind of came to terms with the fact that I was working with a vulnerable population of migrant workers in China, of marriage migrants in Taiwan who also have to cope with well, situations of discrimination, of social contempt, of familial disqualification and economic marginalization in Taiwan. And that, well, the experiences I was looking at and the interactions I was having with my informants had a very strong emotional and affectional dimension. So I decided to be affected by affections and to use affections as part of my methodological tools. And I understood that this sort of affectional proximity and emotional closeness that I developed with, with my informants, with the women, I was working and spending time on a daily basis with uh, could become actually a resource for the construction or perhaps the co-construction together with those women of sociological knowledge itself. The fact of being affected, the, the fact of using affections, emotions, feelings, sentiments as part of my methodology helped me to kind of overstep the separation between the research subject, well, me, and the research object, Chinese marriage migrant women. Uh, it was fun, actually almost entertaining to see that uh, when I was in Taiwan and I was when I was interacting with Fujin for the very first time, you know, it was it was the first time I was in Taiwan. And well, the accent from China and the Taiwanese accent are actually quite different. By that time, I had been living in Nanjing. I had been living in Anhui province. My Chinese was, you know, kind of characterized by a very strong uh, mainland China accent. Kabushar. I was talking like that. Taiwanese people were making fun of me. But this uh, mainland Chinese accent also became a kind of vector of mutual understanding with those women who had me to gain actually this proximity. And uh, I, I, I understood that, well, as a sociologist, as a social scientist, as a researcher, I was actually performing multiple roles on my field site. I was a friend, I was a confident, I was an attentive listener, I was a DMA, I was a sister for them. But sometimes I was also a weird, bizarre alien coming from an undefined Western country. 
split them in the countryside and it was you know this sort of overlap between multiple roles that was helping me to construct a more realistic and pragmatic um, knowledge. Uh, yes, I have a few pictures here from taken uh, in Anhui province, so one of the provinces, the rural provinces those women came from. You can see here, well, pictures of rural daily life. We have a few pictures of the factories. Those women were actually employed before moving to moving to Taiwan. So you can see what a factory, at least from the outside, looks like. On the right side, you can see the dorms, you know, with the with the clothes hanged outside. Some workers who are actually uh, Duan Lian Senti, they are uh, playing some sport at 6.30 in the morning before starting the factory, the factory work. And then you have the workers queuing to enter um, to enter the, the factory, actually. Uh, we are in Zhongshan in Guangdong province, and you can also see the sign which welcomes the workers. Timian Laodong, Zhuanzong, Sanghuo, Kuai Le Guangzuo. I think you can translate it by yourself this sort of honor, working, respect at life, and great happiness around the assembly line of, of the factory. You can see inside a few Chinese factory girls. Uh, inside this textile factory, the bra comes from um, assembling pieces of plastic, silicon, cotton to well to manufacture the famous made in China, made in China clothes. And then you have some bras on the floor of of Fujin's lingerie shop. This is the English class I was teaching at the second floor. And this, the first one, is actually a picture we took when uh, Mei Li and I re-traveled back to, to Taipei in 2018. Fujin closed the shop that day and she organized a kind of little reunion party amongst the sisters who were attending my English class the year before to welcome Mei Li and to welcome, well, partially also me back. So we were gathering together after not seeing each other for a, for a year. So this is just a quick overview of, of what I was I was doing there. Um, before giving you a quick overview on the chapters, the main ideas of the, this book are perhaps five. As I was saying there before, very quickly, I criticize, I move beyond the traditional dichotomy we find in scholarship and literature be between labor and marriage migration. I show how labor and marriage overlap and interwin across women's migratory experiences, but also uh, throughout their ambitions and aspirations and the way they try to construct upward social, economic and moral mobility all along their well, kind of complicated and complex migratory migratory paths. Women develop transnational mobilities which are constructed within a sort of aspirational infrastructure. They will leave China, they will leave the factory, not only seeking, um, you know, up, uh, upward social mobility, but they will seek modernity, they will seek consumerism, they will seek urbanity. They will come to Taiwan, eventually they will find this or not and in case they do not well feel happy and satisfied with the modern cosmopolitan uh, consumerist urban frame of life and work they will divorce and remigrate back to china um, migratory paths whether in china in taiwan or in between are constructed by women oscillating between subalternity vulnerability right and strategies of contestation of of resistance of uh, against vulnerability precarity and social and social contempt so i look at actually the you know the, the the strategies and the practices those women put into practice both individually and collectively to cope with vulnerability and precarity. And I do specifically focus on the economic dimension of precarity, and so I look at the, their entrepreneurial and commercial strategies. Another major idea I try to develop in this book is the link between migration and emotion, and the way the two do, do mutually con inform and construct each other. Migratory paths are constructed through emotional experiences, 
support the making of new positive and negative emotions. Positive and negative emotions, which are constructed as experiences, competencies and resources, not only within the physical reality, but also inside digital platforms and online worlds, which is also a major contribution of this, of this work. As I said, to show the link between migration emotions and digital worlds by looking at this case study of Chinese migrants um, uh, in China and in Taiwan. And all in all, I think that this book gave me the chance to discuss about the new shapes of globalization, at least the new, you know, digital, commercial and uh, um, emotional geographies of globalization, which emerge uh, from women's ex transnational experiences of movement between China and Taiwan and transnational digital entrepreneurial practices between the two between the two countries right so as i said this book is organized around three parts part one on the move in chapter one i look at uh, the, uh, the the way actually this orange fluorescent bra comes to life but i look at this before its actual you know uh, material fabrics i look at the emotional fabrics of this bra this bra is made of imagination, aspiration and ambitions which emerge very quickly since um, the childhood and the teenagehood experiences of these rural girls in the countryside. So I dig into their experiences of rural life and also the social, gendered and moral constraints that they do face in the rural communities they come from and they grew up in. I quickly draw a genealogy of the rural to urban migration in China by showing how the uh, third generation, the young generation of migrant workers and specifically women, uh, migratory experiences from the countryside to the city are constructed not only seeking professional opportunity and economic mobility, but especially seeking modernity, consumerism and urbanity. So those are the major features which characterize women's um, rural to urban migration today. They do not want to get, uh, they do not necessarily want to earn money as their parents or their grandparents could have done, you know, in the, in the 80s or in the 90s. They want to become modern, urban and consumerist women in the city. So they take the road and they move to the large coastal cities. Um, by by hoping actually to fulfill such such dream. In chapter two, I look at the not only the emotional but the material fabrics of this orange bra. So I try to dig again. There is a mistake. I think I was I was sleepy when I prepared my PowerPoint. The geographies of migration and the globalized labor regimes in southern China. I look at the those the way those women arrive to the city which is constructed as a promised land where they can fulfill those urban and modern ambitions. I also show how they, however, face processes of discrimination and marginalization inside the factory and inside the Chinese city uh, and the hardship and and um, and um, and uh, yes, the the the, the, the very tiring uh, dimension of the labor regime inside inside the factory where they are employed and where they actually materially manufacture the bra. I, however, also look at the role of gendered social networks to produce solidarity, which help women to kind of cope with this, you know, daily experiences of discrimination in, in the factory. In chapter three, should I stay or should I go? I look at the ways the bra takes the road and moves to Taiwan. After staying in the city for a longer or shorter time, these women come to terms with the fact that, well, this upward social mobility, urban aspiration and modernity are kind of unachievable in China. At the same time, they face very strong in injunction to marriage. Their parents are calling them saying, OK, now you are old enough. You have to come back to the countryside and you have to get married. But they do not want to. They want to become modern and they want to achieve this urban status. I also saw that, show that very differently from the previous generation. 
rich migrants from China to Taiwan, the way they meet their future Taiwanese husbands and they, you know, arrange their marriage are very different from the from the different generation. It's not more is no more a matter of brokerage is no more a matter of matchmaking made by the families. But, you know, those women work in global factories inside the Chinese global cities where most of the factories they are employed in are owned by the so-called Taishan or where the Taigan are employed. We are talking about Taiwanese managers or Taiwanese high skilled workers who are living and working in China within those delocalized multinational Taiwanese factories, which become sites of new transnational encounters between these Chinese factory girls and these uh, Taiwanese managers or high skilled workers. And it is there that, well, Taiwan is perhaps foreseen as a new land for for departure. So women take the road and move to Taiwan and the bra indeed packed inside a suitcase moves together with them. So part two connectedness. Um, the bra finally arrives in, in Taiwan and in chapter four, women settle down in the new Taiwanese land of arrival. However, they feel trapped in migration. Why? Well, because you do understand that, well, nothing new in my research here, I draw on previous scholarship to show how restrictive actually the migratory and marital regime, which frames uh, women's movement from China to Taiwan is. It is a gendered and kind of restrictive mobility regime where mar marriage is the necessary condition to legally enter and settle down in Taiwan and which brings about a new role performance. Women are not no more workers, women are not only migrants, women are first of all spouses, wife, and the fact of being wives brings about, well, new responsibilities and new roles. They are daughters-in-law, they are mothers, and they have to take care of their family, you know, providing a sort of reproductive labor which frames and constraints their daily life inside the walls of their houses and of their family. At the very same time, until 2009, those Chinese migrant wives could not work. They could not uh, legally work during the first years of their, of their um, during their first years, the two first years in, in Taiwan. In two, from 2009 on, after the reform, they will be able to work as soon as they arrive in Taiwan. However, I would say that nowadays the strongest constraint that those women face in Taiwan is related to situations of marginalization in the job market. Well, even when they go and look for a job, they often are refused an employment because they are Chinese, because they are lowly qualified, because they are not provided with good, you know, professional skills and credentials, because they have a strong accent and because of this standoff and political antagonism between China and Taiwan, which I don't think will be arranged very soon, given the ongoing situation. Um, they face situations of social con con contempt and when these people look down on them. And um, in chapter five, so I try to look a little bit at the biographical transformations of the bra to, uh, to dig into the um, strategies, the first strategies and, uh, and the solidarity practices that those women put into practice to cope with this uh, marginalization in the job market and broad uh, social contempt they face in Taiwan. So I show how their culture of migration associated to a culture of solidarity that they learned in the Chinese factory beforehand when they were young factory girls is kind of reactualized as a resource and as a competency once they are in Taiwan. So the way they develop gender social ties and new solidarity practices which are constructed and performed not only inside the phys physical world, but also and specifically inside the virtual reality throughout these WeChat, um, WeChat groups. I show that from solidarity and, um, and proximity, women develop online emotional communities of Chinese fellow migrants who address each other in terms of sisters because they do share a similar
Germany is related to, well, their origin, their gender, their similar migratory, but also marital experience, right? And those sort of, you know, daily practices of mutual help, support, proximity and closeness become tools to cope with vulnerabi vulnerability. In chapter six, I look at the ways those tools for to cope with vulnerability performed online help women not only to develop practices of social of solidarity, but also to cope with the marginalization in the job market and specifically the economic precarities, right? So I look at the way the bra is re-commercialized inside these digital platforms through the new practices of online um, um, and electronic and emotional commerce and entrepreneurship that those women those women produce and perform. I show that the objects that they do commercialize through processes of import and export between China and Taiwan, from China to Taiwan, from Taiwan to China and between the two countries are actually Process, uh, the commodities that they do trade actually and they do sell in through WeChat and online ha are emotional commodities. They have a very strong emotional dimension which helps women to call upon their social networks base both in China and in Taiwan to develop new clients and commercial partners to succeed in, succeed in their business. I also saw how those emotional commodities, right, the bra, chicken feet, milk powder, infant formula, dry meat, Sichuanese pepper, are not only emotional commodities, but they are also contested commodities, which in some cases transgress import and export restrictions and bans between China and Taiwan, and therefore they do transgress borders, why online and more or less invisibly moving between the two countries. And from this, I try to, to draw actually a broader landscape to show how uh, those emotional and online commercial practices produced by women draw the contours of a new form of emotional petty or petite capitalism produced and performed across new transnational spaces, China and Taiwan, uh, which illuminates actually on the multiple digital, emotional and commercial shapes that globalization can take today, produced and performed by migrants as actors, their uh, em emotional and economic activities, which build bridges between the places, the spaces and the people they cross during their migration. So I will be quick, part three in between us, the bra remigrates to China. In chapter seven, I, I show how metaphorically the bra becomes unaffordable in Taiwan and so it remigrates to China together with women. If women are not successful in their business, if women still feel frustrated, disappointed, disillusioned by the situations of discrimination, vulnerability and precarity in Taiwan, after a few years they can decide to divorce and remigrate back to China, their society of origin. Very interestingly, um, women, uh, as soon as you understood that marriage and migration are linked together, so Indeed, if marriage is the only condition for women to legally enter and settle down in Taiwan, as soon as the marital tie vanishes, they are deported and they should leave the country and go back to China, right? However, most of the informants I found, we are talking about 30 women I could interview, divorced and remigrated back to China after becoming Taiwanese. So after they obtained Taiwanese citizenship, they decided to divorce and move back. Why? Well, because they are aware of the um, of the difficulties to settle down, to find a job, of the structure of inequalities in China, and they want to some extent to take advantages of the benefits this Taibao Zheng, so this Taiwanese citizenship, can bring about for Taiwanese people in, in China. So they initially move back to the, their countryside of origin. They seek the support of their families and friends there, but they quickly come to terms with the fact that the countryside, they do not belong anymore to rural areas. And so they remove back to the cities they had been previously living and working in 
were teenage time uh, as factory as factory girls. So the bra refollows women to the city and it will be resold actually in most cases to the city. So they resettled down in, Guan, in Guangdong province mostly, in Shenzhen, in Dongguan, in Guangzhou. I was living with two of them in Shenzhen for three months actually. And they, well, they, they, they will be Taiwanese. They will have acquired this Taiwanese citizenship. They will not go back to the factory they had been working beforehand. They know how to become entrepreneurs. They know how to make business themselves and they will do this in the city. So they will take advantage of the social networks they left in Taiwan to trade new products between China and Taiwan. In some cases, they will set a physical shop like a beauty center or a food shop, a food stand in, in, in the Chinese city. And they will also keep on trading through their so online social networks some other products online, like the bra, but also other other commodities. So they, they, they make good use both of the networks of Chinese sisters still living in Taiwan and also of the networks of Chinese sisters who, like them, divorced and resettled in, in Taiwan. So we see how actually the Taiwanese citizenship becomes a resource for immigration to China and a resource for entrepreneurship. Most of the women told me uh, I became Taiwanese now, so I can become a boss here. I don't need to be a Dagong Mei. I don't need to stay here and work Dagong anymore. I am Taiwanese and I can, you know, perform my citizenship. I can open a Taiwanese style uh, New Romian restaurant. I can open a, a beauty center in Shenzhen where I do, you know, cosmetic treatments in a Taiwanese style. And indeed, Chinese people will find this of high quality. They will be fascinated and they will increase the number of, of their clients. I will conclude chapter nine, the transnationalization of the brass biography. Well, you understood these women resettled down in China, but they are on the road again, again, and over again, right? In Taiwan, they're left their sisters. In most cases, they're left their children together with their previous husbands. And so actually the remigration into China is just the prelude for father movements. They keep on moving back and forth both physically by taking the plane, right, and virtually by keeping in touch online between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. The bra metaphorically or even physically travels together with them. They take advantage of their multiple belongings, their multiple identities, their transnational affinities and affections to develop cosmopolitan biographies, this sort of Paulai, Pao Chu, as they often said, back and forth lives and in between existences between the two sides of the strait. I will let you discover the conclusion in the book. I will stop here and I thank you very much for your attention. Yes, I got too passionate and I talked too long, but thank you for being patient and patient and for listening to me. Yeah, fantastic. That was really, um, uh, really fascinating to kind of uh, hear the kind of the the whole process, how it, how it developed from the initial kind of uh, first trips to China and then to uh, to Taiwan. And I guess as field work seems such a distant thing, it was really enjoyable hearing um, uh, that uh, that that kind of process. And there were kind of so many kind of anecdotes in the story that I found really fascinating, such as uh, the the way that Taiwanese would kind of make fun of us researchers because of our mainland Chinese um uh accents um i've got loads of questions but let me just start with um a, a couple um of more kind of methodological questions i mean the first one that um i was curious about was to what extent was this project uh, a planned one or did the design kind of evolve um over time because i mean um uh it to me it felt hard to imagine this project being one that was you had a kind of a, a big plan at the, at the outset. And it, uh, so that was one question. And the other question um, that I was also thinking about was the uh, the way that you changed the um, uh, the PhD to the the uh, the book. Um, we'd be talking about this in a, in a lot of, um, uh, of sessions. And and um, and I know that in, okay, in some countries, 
let's say in the US or and my guess from what I know in France, often the um, uh, the PhDs can be quite a lot longer than in the UK. And that can actually make that that transition um, quite complicated. Uh, so just a couple of things to, to start off with. And I can see we've already got some questions coming in. Thank you very much, David, for your questions. Well, yes, you are very right. This was absolutely not planned. It was I had to keep on constructing and reconstructing, you know, my research object as as it is uh, by following what I was seeing and what I was observing. Uh, it was really, you know, it was really a matter of developing a fully empirical approach to research and to my research object and to keep on, you know, negotiating and renegotiating my field sites according to what, well, I was brought about to discover. I think I was happy because I could really, um, I was really seeking serendipity at some point, you know. I was really surprised by what I saw and that's why I had to keep on, you know, reorienting my journey as well. And uh, I was discovering new things. I was taking a flight together with women to Jin Man, and I ended up in hidden garages. You will find this in the book. I removed back to China. I did not expect to go back to Taiwan with Mei Li in 2018. I did not expect to go back to China and rejoin her in 2018 after she divorced. It was really, you know, it was really ethnography by trick and thin, I'd say, step by step, by trial and error, but especially, you know, following following the rhythm and the tempos of of, of, of my field sites and of what I, I had under under my nose. And this was very challenging. So it was long. It was in the end very long ethnographic work because I had to stop. I, I think I could have carried on for a while more, but it was more than two years actually. So between all the back and forth movements, it was two years of fieldwork, which is kind of long. And, uh, but it was worth it. I, I really enjoyed doing this. And as for your second question, yes, turning my PhD dissertation into a book was kind of an ordeal. It was a struggle, shorter than expected in the end. But uh, the problem is that, well, first of all, my PhD dissertation was in English, which is dif very different from most of the of the French students in France, where they, I mean, they write their dissertation in French. But my co-supervisor was uh, Xiao Xinhuang in, in Taipei. So, well, he, he had to read through that at some point. So I had to write it in English, but it was still 700 pages which is absolutely ridiculous and pathetic because I kept on repeating and repeating over and again the same thing, perhaps. And um, at the same time, I remember that when I was writing my PhD dissertation, I had a, I had a chat with a, with a scholar, with a professor who is in Geneva, and he told me, Beatrice, one thing that you have to think about is that you have to turn this into a book as soon as possible. So just imagine when you write your PhD dissertation, imagine a book. You will have a very long, you know, I had a very long theoretical framework of 120 pages, very sociological, absolutely unreadable. Then I had another absurd part, which was the methodological framework, 140 pages, again, unreadable. But then I had the three parts arranged as they are in the book and the conclusion, which has absolutely changed. And so what he told me, he said, well, your theoretical framework and methodological framework, you will just select and do control C, you will, you will delete it. And then it would be the book. And well, it was, it was not that smooth, but that was a good start. So I arrived with something which had already kind of a, a book format. And then I tried to, um, I tried to cut, to cut over and again, all the repetitions to change this very sociological jargon into a comprehensible language and to cut all the redundancies and the, and the repetitions. That took kind of four months, more or less. So it was kind of fast in the end, but it was self-lockdown, it was COVID, we were not going outside. So I was taking advantage of this, of this pandemic to, to do so. And um, and then something I would I did and I would recommend everyone to do is 
to start working not on the introduction and the conclusion, but really on the text of the book, so the real content of the book, and then to write the introduction in the very end where you will give the reader a kind of an overview of the content of the book and you will put you know your main ideas together to write a, a nice introduction a sexy introduction you have to you have to make promotion of the book you know someone opens your book they are not very long a thousand a hundred thousand words still but from the first lines the reader has to has to find it sexy otherwise they will not go on and then to uh, write the conclusion in the very end uh, the, at least this is what, what I did. The introduction was really the last thing I wrote and it was the thing that took me the longest because I totally changed it from my PhD dissertation. It had nothing to do. It's not very long. It's kind of 20 something pages, 25 mm. pages, but it took a month to write just the introduction. Mm. And, and then the advice I would give everyone is not don't be shy. First, when you write, you know, the synopsis of your book, the, your book proposal, get someone else's book proposal, take a look, see how they are structured. Do not hesitate to ask to your previous PhD supervisor, just to friends or colleagues or senior scholars to give you advice before you send it to the publisher. And then the second advice when I say do not be shy is do not hesitate to ask to people to read through your chapters before you send them to the publisher. I, I was cutting my, my dissertation and I kept on sending the chapters to my colleagues and friends. Some of them were sociologists, some of them they were China and Taiwan experts, some of them they were just scholars in social sciences. I mean, you will not ask if, if someone who works in physics, right? But mm. do not only ask people who are in your direct field, because this book is not written only for specialists, it's a book for an audience in social sciences. And so you have to make mm. sure that the reader understands. And I remember that even after I spent crazy time cutting my, my book, there were still some weird concepts and some weird sentences my friends and colleagues were advising to cut. So mm. do not hesitate, don't be shy. There is no shame in asking for help and to seek advice and ask people to read through that because you do not write for yourself, you write for the others, right? And this is very, very important. And um, for the introduction, I asked my P previous PhD supervisor and the sociologist to read through that because for me it was, I think that the introduction is perhaps one of the most important part of the book actually, more than the conclusion. And um, and so you want to make sure that that is not only readable, but also sexy, interesting, catchy, appealing, and it gets the attention of someone. Fantastic. That's really useful practical um, uh, guidance there. Um, uh, Cheng Yu, did you want to come in with your question? Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Zani. Uh, my name is Dr. Zani. Who calls me doctor? Nobody calls me doctor. Even my students call me Bea. So. Okay. Beatrice, it's fine. Yeah, uh, my name is Cheng Yu from uh, MA Taiwan Studies. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. That's quite fascinating when, especially when you talk about the social life of things and use this orange bra as a kind of, uh, sort of like a, a metaphor or uh, uh, an in, intro or framework upon your book, um, because in my understanding that uh, the origin of why social life of things is comes about like exploring the agencies of the object in relation with the people's like social lives and really reminds me of the this uh, Japanese mushrooms book written from Anat Singh. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, but uh, in my point of view, if I uh, see it rightly, that Anna Ting in her book is quite used the commodity of mushroom as a kind of like material entity uh, instead of uh, so metaphor. So my question for you is quite related on this, um, you know, the material uh, properties of this much uh, of this material object uh, aka the bra so 
uh, for example, in, in your chapter two, you're trying to say the fabric, fabrics of the bra. So could you elaborate more, for example, how such like fabric of bra, the materiality of the bra could, uh, could relate it to uh, those women's social life? And what's the relations between, you know, uh, the subject and object in your research? Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a fascinating question and I can really see that you master anthropological literature quite, quite well. Um, yes, the fact of using objects and artefacts draws on this tradition by Apadurai and, Kop and Kopitov and then later on we had multiple authors from different traditions who actually uh, took advantage of materiality, material culture. Daniel Miller did so check stuff, his book 2010, many people did so. Uh, however, what, what, I'm, what I try to show through the material fabrics of the bra, and I will answer to your question, is the way these material fabrics are at the very same time, simultaneously, also social and emotional, and that's, the three levels cannot be re really be separated. You know, uh, the bra emerges in women imagination before in women's imagination and ambitions before they actually produce it it is because they have this in their imaginary and what this symbolizes and means to them that they migrate to the city and they do manufacture it materially you know physically around the assembly line so let's assume that for them in the countryside before migrating the bra embodies modernity, consumerism, independence, autonomy. They know that um, they know this uh, exists in the city, both from the tales that their uh, fellow migrants have been telling them while coming back to the countryside, for example, to celebrate the new year, but also from the images they could see on the Internet, through their smartphones, on the television about, you know, the urban, the urban lifestyle. So they migrate to the city they enter the, fa the factory and they hope that by the fact of, you know, sewing plastic and silicone together, assembling the pieces together to make the bra, they will achieve this modernity and consumerism. However, and here you could argue, well, but this is commodity fetishism and yes, it is partially so. So they put the pieces of, of plastic and cotton together, they assemble the bra, but this 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 work around the assembly line this assembling the pieces together uh, labor and experience is uh, painful is painful and the more the more they do this the more they come to terms with the fact that yes they are producing the bra they will be unable never and ever they will never able to buy because they cannot afford it because they do not earn enough money because they do not have enough free time since they work 17 hours per day in the factory right so at the very they are closer to the bra they they they, they manufacture its material but they materially but they get more and more emotionally distant from them so from it so they gradually come to terms with the fact that it, it is precisely by materially manufacturing it, they come to terms with the fact that this bra embodies something they will never achieve. Great, fantastic. Let me, can I move on to our yeah, um, sure. our we'll second be faster question. in answering. Um, uh, so Stuart, would you like to come in? Hi, uh, Beatrice, great talk, very interesting. Um, I think it's uh, very appropriate that you and Daffod have arranged the talk for today, being International Women's Day. Um, it seems to me there's two points I wanted to make in particular. Uh, one is you have a focus on emotional closeness. Now, one way of reading Marjorie Wolf a long time ago might be that women might or girls might set off being filial daughters and then they become... Um, interested in their peers, so their uh, GMA sororities, uh, then perhaps interested in, in marriage and that a close relationship with the husband, and then finally uh, interested in setting up their Yuxora local family, uh, the relationship with their children. It seems from what you said that the closest, the, that perhaps the ambition for close emotional relationships 
varies through their lifetime according to uh, their different situations. And it might well be that their closest relationships that are ongoing are the virtual relationships with their GMA. The second thing I wanted to say is that uh, you had a very interesting typo on chapter six. I read it as being not e entrepreneurs, but e etrepreneurs. And it seems to me that for, as you described it, for the women, their raison d'etre um, becomes being successful entrepreneurs. That's what their ambition is, not close emotional relationships at all. And that there is potentially quite a lot of instrumentalism um, being used, uh, including perhaps marrying and then divorcing a Taiwan husband in order to achieve that goal. So I wondered what your, your thoughts were on that. Thank you very much for your question. Well, indeed, emotions are, as you pointed it out, constructed. Emotions do not exist per se. Emotions are constructed within a situation, a social frame, a practice, a context, which indeed varies over time and space. And the four emotions do vary according to, well, the situations they do deal with during the migratory experiences, the spaces they cross, the people they meet. So th this emotional closeness also varies in terms of degree and extension according, well, it is in, constructed in situ, it is constructed through experiences and practices. So I, I do fully agree on this. Uh, as for this, um, you know, instrumental dimension, I'm not quite sure because what I've been observing and perhaps I was not clear enough or I was vague enough to give you the curiosity to dig into my chapters is the way um, um, ties of trust, of closeness, of proximity and of friendship, of amity are fundamental in settling this business which in some cases is illegal, invisible hidden. So the fact that their networks are not only social but do have this sort of trust, affectional dimension, supports the making of this sort of activities. At the very same time, when I talked about this emotional dimension of commerce and e-entrepreneurship, e right, very true that it is performed and um, you know, supported by the use of digital technologies and the performance inside the virtual world. However, I really show how the commodities women do commercialize are very, at very low value. You know, a made in China bra, I mean, who would buy? It costs nothing. Who would buy uh, Sichuanese powder? Uh, who would buy dried meat? Who would trade Chinese cosmetics between the Taiwan Straits? Only those Chinese women. Why? Why would they import this? La Ro, this dried meat made by their grandma in Sichuan countryside to Taiwan. Who would buy that? Not the Taiwanese people and perhaps not myself either, but their Chinese sisters, they will buy that. So it's a matter of knowing indeed in an instrumental, if you know, way, the structure of the offer and the demand uh, related to the Thai Chinese and Taiwanese market, but also the emotional dimension of the commodities that they do trade. So that's why I qualify this commerce of emotional. I don't know if you understand. And you could, for example, also look at a certain literature, I think about Manuel Orozco, for example, in the US, who wrote about the nostalgic trade in a different way that I do, but it shows how actually the fact of consuming some products and of trading some products by migrants and the diasporas, it draws on the case of um, Salvadorian and Mexican in the US, right? It's, it could be the same. And it shows actually how this commodity is the fact of consuming and producing those at a high emotional dimension which is relating to feelings of nostalgia, melancholia, homesickness. And this is kind of the same when women develop business. So I, I would not call it instrumental, actually. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I really take a lot of distance from this homo economicus vision of migration and this, you know, kind of behavioralist or instrumental 
uh, attitude of, of migrants. There are multiple things which play a role into the game and which overlap. OK, fantastic. Um, so we have a, a question in the chat from one of our uh, alumni, Raymond. Right. Um, and he was asking about uh, restrictions and asking um, whether um, in the future, if uh, tensions are severe between China and Taiwan, whether your field could become extinct. Um, and I, I guess I was also th one of the things that came through in your talk was the way that changes in cross strait relations impacts this kind mm -hmm. of uh, migration, such as uh, you mentioned, um, okay, with Maidu coming to power, then uh, work rights were um, uh, were changed. And I think the, the period of time it takes to get uh, citizenship also was um, uh, reduced. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if you wanted to um, add anything um, uh, uh, on, on this um, element about the the kind of almost the geopolitical uh, side to uh, marriage migration. Thank you very much. It's also an interesting point which deserves attention in the future years. The answer is yes, perhaps. I have no idea. I We keep on looking at this, right? Um, to, you, to some extent, your question and what the feed was pointing out shows that, well, marriage and migratory uh, policies, the mobility regimes, the, these migratory experiences are constructed within a specific frame, which is also political, geopolitical, social, cultural, which again varies over time and space, and that we cannot kind of predict or forecast the future orientation of, mm. of movement, of migration and of practices, right? And it's always a matter of, well, keeping on doing new research and new fieldwork to be as close as possible to what, to what we study. And this is perhaps the only reflection at this point I can I can have. Indeed, the political context, as I said, the political standoff between the two countries has, mm. has been playing a major role in the making of, well, the first uh, migratory policies, the revision and the amendments of the migratory, the migratory act. And uh, well, the future is uncertain and we will mm -hmm. see what what will happen. And just just to kind of like a follow up question, um, to what extent is this kind of return migration something quite recent uh, or has it been going on um, um, for a while? No, return migration is something pretty recent, I would say. I, mm. I Most of the returnees I could find in China were young, very young. Mm. Were in their, I mean, they were about 34 to 35, which meant that, yeah, they migrated to Taiwan in their early 20s. But still, we are talking about a kind of recent phenomenon, I think. Mm. Also because uh, what women were telling me to some extent is that, yes, we are living in Taiwan now, but we are also curious to know what's going on in China, because China, well, the despite the fact that it's in, again and still an egal highly inegalitarian society and it will remain like this for a while and there is nothing to do. Uh, however, women are kind of fascinated by the so-called opportunities they they see in China, the personal development, uh, as they say, the personal development opportunities brought about well, the transformation of the urban labor market, this e-commercial uh, potential uh, provided by well, new technologies, Alibaba, Taobao, whatever platforms, right? And so they, they are also curious to move back according to this, well, new opportunities structure that they do they do see there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we've, we've ne now got a question, okay, um, from uh, Zrinka, and she's asked a couple of things about the kind of organization of both the internal China labor migration, but also, and this is a question I'd also been thinking about um, in terms of the marriage migration to Taiwan. So she was asking, to what extent is this uh, brokered, organized by agencies, or to what extent is it more to do with uh, the Taiwanese that they might meet in these kind of factories? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's also an interesting question. I think that I deal with this in chapter three mm -hmm. and I show how well the rural to urban migration in China has been changing in terms of aspirations and ambitions 
over the three generations of migrant workers. So those who migrated in the 80s, in the 90s and in, in the 2000s, right? And they show how those changes in terms of, well, generational practices, ambitions and experiences from in, within the frame of rural to urban migration also mirror the changes uh, in terms of marriages negotiated with Taiwanese people. So if at the very beginning, uh, let's say in the 80s or in the 90s, and the works, I, I don't know, by uh, Melody Chan Wenlu, by Isabel Chang, by Lara Momesso, by uh, Sarah Friedman, there are, there are many people who dealt with this, really show that um, the first two generations of women's uh, marriage was brokered was a matter of matchmaking, of having some Taiwanese people traveling directly, in most cases, to the rural villages they were coming to. I also show that the complexification of migratory paths and the transformation of the Chinese city and its labor market into a global city where a lot of Taiwanese enterprises settled down and foreign enterprises settled down changes this pattern of marriage and, and, and migration to Taiwan. So it is really what I show. Um, f f the most cases I found actually are um, a matter of individual negotiation of marriage and migration. Women met their husbands in the city they work in. Uh, their husbands were Taigan, they were high skilled workers who were working there and they had been living in China for several years. And I mean, they, they they, they fell in love eventually or eventually not and they met and they decided to get married so it's really it's really a matter of individual choice and brokerage and matchmaking is less and less common and i also interviewed actually in taiwan a matchmaker a chinese one she showed me you know the catalogs with the spouses and um and the brides, right, and the way, you know, the dowry and things were arranged and the money paid and it was like, it was in Taoyuan, close to, in Lincoln, close to Taoyuan. And she, she was telling me now all the foreign brides we have on catalogs are from Vietnam and from the Philippines. And, well, Chinese people come here by themselves. Um, okay, and there are less me... Chinese people coming also. Mm. Let me hand over to, uh, to Biu. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's fascinating talk and fascinating topic, especially um, I can see when you said um, keep in mind, always keep it sexy. And we should all learn from that. And with the first picture of the bra, I, I think you've definitely achieved that. Thank you very much. And we, we, we really need to uh, um, be more wary about this. Uh, I think you're right. Um, not necessarily sexy, but maybe more uh, less boring. OK, so I, got I just want to make a new promotion because out of this book, there will be a comic, a sociological comic, The Journey of the Orange Bra, which will be out in 2023. So we will have time to make a promotion. Yeah, I got funding. So we are I got a drawer and a playwright. So we are doing a sociological comic out of this. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I actually got quite a, a few questions, but I just I can see quite a, a lot of uh, questions here already. So may I ask, um, because you mentioned about this kind of need to have uh, uh, intimate relations, especially with um, quite a lot of sisters, mate, right? Sisterhood is very important for uh, foreign. They were more or less alien foreigners in, in Taiwan. I wonder how about sisterhood in Taiwan and among ta these people with Taiwanese women? Is there any this kind of supporting group or uh, circles that you know of? Because, you know, like uh, Stuart said, today is Women's Day. You know, we can't divide them from the local. That's one thing. And another thing I would really want to know, because it struck me when you said when they re-migrate back to China, they claim or they at least have a different kind of identity. They self-proclaimed Taiwaneseness. So what does it mean to be a Chinese Taiwanese in China? OK, the two questions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll try to be as short as possible. Um, so 
sister ruden ties with taiwanese local women not that many uh, the only i would say that the only ties of closeness they may develop are with the activists or the volunteers the taiwanese activists or volunteer who work for local associations ngos or governmental institutions which support uh foreign migrants and foreign migrant women whether they are from china or from southeast asia so we have a closer a closer a closer ties in some cases actually what i saw because i also attended a few you know this sort of vocational classes the taiwanese government organizes and sets for foreign for foreign migrants and for women um, were sometimes ties of closeness with other nationalities. So women who migrated from the Vietnam, from Cambodia, from the Philippines, and they were, you know, all in the same vocational class. And indeed, they they had very good, very good relations. The second question: What does this mean to be a Chinese Taiwanese, Taiwanese Chinese, or Chinese Taiwanese in China? Well, not much. I show how actually identity per se is uh it's a matter again of perform i mean not much for those women those women do not care much about being taiwanese or chinese itself they just care about the social status that that can provide them with i i try to explain myself in most cases they told me when i am in taiwan i am chinese when i am in china i am taiwanese but perhaps i'm just the two the fact is that because of the rural origin, in most cases, when they are in urban China, people will look down on them. They will they will think that they 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 are not you know educated enough. They are not provided with skills enough. But the fact of being Taiwanese all of a sudden make them more well interesting. Uh, Taiwanese people still have a, a good reputation. Those women before migrating already told me that before migrating for the very first time to Taiwan. They told me how Taiwan it was really pictures that the promised land because of the, the, the photos and the, what they could see in their textbooks or on television. It's really a matter of imagination. And it is the same when they when they go back and they say we are Taiwanese. I, 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 I show how Mei Li, when she makes business, she sells some buffalo expired meat to her Cantonese clients on their stand. And she she just tells them to make fun of them that this is imported from Taiwan. And actually people are 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 queuing to buy that just because it is imported from Taiwan. It is Taiwan, but in the end it's just the expired buffalo meat that she bought from her cousin living nearby. And same goes for the colza oil that she uses to cook. She says that this is Ganlan Yo that she got from the West uh, through her context in Taiwan for a very good price, very differently from China, it's just, you know, inexpensive uh, colza oil that she could get at the local market. <laughs> there is still this state, social status uh, hidden behind Taiwanese-ness uh, under the eyes of Chinese people. Thank you. Okay, so we've, we've almost run out of time now. I could I mean, some people have asking for a, a, a follow up uh, question, but I could see there's one um, audience member that hadn't asked uh, a question yet. So Huang Baoyi is asking a, uh, a question about whether the women in this book are mostly economic migrants. Um, uh, how do they see their economic prospects in, in Taiwan as China has become blooming um, or booming uh, in the past decade? Does Taiwan still have this pull factor for young for these young Chinese uh, women? I mean, push-pull factors and push-pull theories in migration studies are mm. old and are totally, we, we, we forgot about that ah. uh, in the 80s. So there are no more economic migrants. Scholarship literature has showed how there are multiple you know, reasons supporting migration and pushing people to move. It's not only earning money, it's not only the attractiveness and the sort of development theories which say, oh, this is a rich country, come here. Indeed, there is this economic dimension, but it's not the only one. A poor social mobility, economic mobilities are also constructed, and I, I try to show this in the book, within this aspirational infrastructure. There are emotions, there are networks, there are multiple factors which play into the game 
when when imagining and constructing a migratory path and the fact of showing that uh, labor migration from China in China from the countryside to the city and marriage migration from the city to Taiwan cannot be thought in terms of two separated steps, but they are highly connected and interwined throughout the ambitions and aspirations of these women tries to actually yeah go beyond this sort of 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 conceptualization. OK, fantastic. Um, let me just um, um, uh, Yang Cheng you, you wanted to come back on the symbolic meaning of the orange uh, bra. Uh, why is it specifically orange? Oh, the, the were blue, green and uh, and pink. I, I was offered the orange bra. Ah. I mean, the one I showed to you, it's a picture I took on my bed of the bra I brought back. It's kind of a push up. I don't really wear it, but, you know, it has this very strong emotional and affectional dimension for, for me, too. It's orange because the one I was offered was orange, but there were multiple colors, but they were all fluorescent. Mm. Uh, fantastic. OK, so we're going to have to bring things to a close, but this is just the start of um, a week of Taiwan Studies events at SOAS. So tomorrow afternoon, uh, we have two in-person events. Uh, at three o'clock, we welcome back our former SOAS alumni, uh, Felix um, uh, Brenda, who's going to be t who's going to be talking about uh, transitional justice as identity building in um, in Taiwan. So Felix was our undergraduate and uh, postgraduate student. So he'll be speaking at three o'clock in the uh, BGLT, and then we'll follow that up with a another postdoc, but this time a postdoc at Cambridge, uh, Chen Boshi, who's going to be giving a talk titled "Staging Diao Yutai." Overseas Taiwanese students and the um, uh, spoken drama movement in 1970s uh, United States. And then um, on Friday, we're going to be welcoming another Canadian uh, uh, based scholar, uh, Joseph Wong, who will be giving a book talk um, on his new book, From Development to Democracy, the Transformation of uh, Modern Asia, Asia. And that will be at 12 o'clock Friday in the BGLT. So we've got a really exciting um, um, uh, week ahead. And we will also be having another online talk uh, next week on uh, on Mazu. But um, uh, we'll announce that closer to the time. So I look forward to uh, seeing many of you in person uh, tomorrow and Friday. Um, and hopefully we'll be seeing Beatrice in, uh, in Europe again uh, soon, maybe in uh, Eats or when you're next um, over in in France, if you can uh, drop by, as things are a lot, lot easier now to uh, to travel. Finally, so um, would people like to kind of turn on your cameras and um, uh, and we can give um, Beatrice another big round of applause and thank her. Wow, it's looking cold there in um, in the office. Yeah, <laughs> we are still minus ten degrees here. It's it's yes. Ah, okay. I need to catch the train. That's all. Oh, yes. OK. Thank uh, you. Could we get a, a few more cameras on and then we'll get a group picture and. Oh, great. Great. Nice to see you, Good. Jingfei. Good. Should we give her a round of applause? Yeah, let's give her a round of applause. Oh, to you guys. You had so many wonderful questions. Thank you very much. It was really interesting to talk with you. And, and how you can, can you get the picture? Yeah, yeah. Um, three, two, one. Thank <laughs> okay, you. fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks, then. Thank you. Thank you. See you, everyone. Well, it's a fascinating week and multiple events go on. And thank you very much again for having me. I've been very happy. It great. is great. Thank you very much. Bye bye. And good luck with all those job interviews as well. Yes. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye then. Bye. Bye. Have a nice bye. evening. Bye. Then. Bye. Bye. bye.